Now, don't use it as an excuse. Use it as an, a stepping stone no, to succeed right. because we want to break those generational curses mm -hmm. and we want to be better than the generation before us. And then we want to reach back and bring somebody up with us. So standing in the gap is about giving back. It's about showing up for people who have no one else to show up for them. I am Dr. Tanja Williams, president of St. Petersburg College, and you are listening to Standing in the Gap. Welcome to another episode of Standing in the Gap with Dr. Tanja Williams. I am so excited for our partner here today. Let me tell you about her. She is the Honorable Judge Patrice Moore. She is a judge on Sixth Judicial Circuit and is the first African-American female to serve in this prestigious position. She currently serves as, and I must read, the Unified Family Court Administrative Judge, where she presides over delinquency, dependency, domestic violence injunctions, girls court, drug court, and family law matters involving dependency court. She is standing in the gap in various parts of our community. And so I want to welcome Judge Patrice Moore. Thank you so much for being here today. And you know, I always enjoy spending time with you for real. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So Judge Moore from St. Petersburg, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Born, born and raised. Born and raised. Yes, ma'am. So how did you become a judge? How did you go from St. Pete girl to being a judge? Well, actually, I wanted to be an electrical engineer. <laughs> really? <laughs> and my dad, he took me to, it was then Florida Power. They had a camp, and then I realized that that was not <laughs> what I wanted to do. Soon thereafter, I just decided that I wanted to help people who did not have the money mm -hmm. to help themselves. And so that was started my passion. And so I wanted to do this. This started about seventh or eighth grade. So I wow. knew pretty much early on in life what I wanted to be in life. That's amazing. So, okay, in seventh or eighth grade you knew, and then you went to Florida Memorial? Yes, I graduated from Florida Memorial in 1991, mm -hmm. and then I entered Stetson a year later. Wow. Yes. Wow. Oh, you started at Florida Memorial, and then you went to Stetson? Yes, I went to Stetson for law school. Wow, okay, yes. so you got through law school. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what was that like? Law school was a whole different world. You know, the first year, it was like I was in this warp zone. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember doing anything except for eating, sleeping, and reading. I had no other life it. outside of that, yes. That was it. It was an experience that I wouldn't trade for the world because it set the tone for what it is that I'm doing now, mm -hmm. yes. There's so many people out there in the audience who, in their minds, they may want to be a judge. They may aspire to do it, but the steps you had to take to get there, I know that there were a lot of times you felt like, okay, I'm just gonna have to buckle up and make this happen. How did you get through it all? I, it just seems to me it wasn't like you woke up, okay, I went to Florida Memorial, then I went to Stetson and now I'm here. So some things had to happen in between that to get you to this point. And it did. First of all, prayer, prayer, and more prayer. <laughs> oh, that's right. But being a judge was not my dream. Oh. I owe it all to Mr. the late uh, Mr. Bob Dillinger. Okay. It was him who inspired me to dream. And it started out, he had asked me if I would consider becoming a judge. And the first answer was no. Five years later, we were at a Christmas <laughs> party <laughs> and he asked me again. And by then phones were a little bit smart. They're not as smart as they are now. They were a little bit smart. And he had asked me if I would consider uh, running for judge. And my intent was just to get him out of my face. And so I said, yes. So he said, wait a minute, I need to record it. So he did. I said, yes, but in the back of my mind, it was really no, but something in my soul wouldn't, wouldn't allow that no to be no. And so uh, the voice inside said that if fear is the only reason why you're not doing this, then you don't have a reason not to do it. Mm. And mm. that day, that moment, I, I filled out the application and I put it in the mail. Wow. And to be a judge, you have to be elected, right? I mean, you can be appointed okay. um, by the uh, judicial nominating uh, okay. committee, but I was elected. I went through the whole election you process. Went, going through the election process, I know you had your haters and you had your lovers, you had the, the, both. Yeah. To be judge, you had to be able to tune out the negative stuff, right? Yes. How do you, even as a judge today, how do you uh, address that? Because we know we can't make everybody happy, but 
How do you address those negative voices? And the truth of the matter is, in life, you're never going to make everyone happy. No. So uh, my, I start off every day praying mm -hmm. because I don't, I can't get out of the car and then go into the courtroom. Mm -hmm. So I start each day off with praying and making sure that I am true, not only to myself, but true to the people that walk into my courtroom. Because although I may not rule in their favor, I want their voices to be heard. Got it. I want them to feel that if nothing else, the process was a true process. Mm -hmm. And so although they may not like the process, I'm hoping that they respect it. And I understand when you're talking about taking people's children out of their homes yeah. or terminating their parental rights yeah. or sending a child to a program. It is not easy and so somebody is not going to be happy. And so you get that. But at the end of the day, if I know that I am fair, I can live with myself. So being a judge, you, you definitely are going to have some folks who you might not please in the judgment. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to make decisions. Yes, ma'am. And when I think about us um, growing up in, in South St. Pete and things of that nature, we always had to make decisions. And some of those decisions might be to go to school or not go to school or mm -hmm. to take this job or not to take this job. But when you're a judge, you have a bunch of laws and things behind you that dictate sort of what can happen. Right. Yes, yes ma'am. When you're in a tight pickle and you have to make that decision and it's it's gray because I know you have some gray areas, but you have to make the decision. Mm -hmm. How did you grow up in the skin you're in to say, I'm going to make the decision, the best decision that I can? What do you use to do that? I use my experience in the field. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm always going to follow the law. Yep. But when I have the discretion mm -hmm. in order to one, divert to the left or divert to the right, what I do is I listen to both sides and I try to be fair to both sides and come up with something that I think is just and fair in it's the amazing. middle. And it's not always easy to make those tough decisions, but mm -hmm. it is what I promised to do when I was elected. And exactly. so whether it hurts my soul or not, I have to make the decision. And, and especially working in family court and, and working on whether the child stays, goes, or whatever has mm -hmm. to happen. Mm -hmm. Being that you grew up here, have you ever seen anybody you knew? I see people every day. <laughs> I see people every day, whether it is there with their grandkids mm -hmm. or or their children, um, because if you're born and raised in St. Pete yeah. and you have court in Clearwater <laughs> and you serve the citizens of St. Pete, it is probably highly unlikely that you won't, that you won't see, see yeah. somebody that you yeah. know. Yes. And, I, and I know that. And one of the things that I'd like the audience to understand, what Judge Moore is saying is sometimes in the career that you choose, you're gonna see people you know, and you're gonna have to be able to one, be discreet, keep their situation to yourself, but then you still gotta do your job. And I think that sometimes we have individuals who have jobs that may weigh over to the side of their friend or somebody they know. Being a judge, you cannot do that. <laughs> Being a judge, you cannot do that. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot do that. So Judge Moore, um, being that we both are the first African-American females in our field. What would you tell an aspiring woman who wants to be a judge? Look into the camera and tell her what should she do? I would say dare to dream because there's nothing special about me. It was the favor and grace of God. Mm. I would tell you to please pursue your dreams because being the first should not mean that I am the last. No, that's right. I should, my shoulders are the shoulders that you are to stand on in order to make this feel expansive. And so I tell every man, woman, boy and girl mm -hmm. to dare to dream. And it, it doesn't have to do with job, just the yeah. job. It can be about dare to dream about school. Because guess what? You may think that you can't get into that college because it's way up here, but there is no ceiling with God. No, that's right. So dare to dream. No, that's right. And, and I appreciate that. And I do want to piggyback on something that she said, because even though I'm a college president, I've been told no to at schools. <laughs> I've yes. been rejected. <laughs> and yes. you have to be willing to still be comfortable in the skin you're in and say, that one told me no, but I'm going to go to this one. This door didn't open. I'm going to knock on that one and keep going. And don't let how you start dictate where you finish. Because if I go by what I had, you know, Judge Moore growing up, there's no way I would be here because because, because I would not be here. I, I, me I can't, either. Me you know? either. I was raised by my grandma, so I wouldn't be here either. My mom was a senior when she had me, and my dad was a freshman in college. So mm. there you go. There it is. So you can't let your start um, dictate your end ending. You have to actually take what you've learned, the good and the bad, and grow with that and go with that. 
you, you know, right? I, am yes, I saying anything you yes. feel? And don't use it as an excuse. Use it as an, a stepping stone to succeed right. because we want to break those generational curses mm -hmm. and we want to be better than the generation uh, before us. And then we want to reach back and bring somebody up with us. Exactly. Yes. And that's exactly what you're doing. So I'm going to step outside of your um, judge role. Yes, ma'am. And I'm going to step into the community role. Yes, ma'am. I mean, from working with um, children who are foster kids to um, working with JWB, um, the community work you do with the um, links and with AKA Alpha Kappa Alpha Incorporated. Let me get that correct. <laughs> How do you make time for, to me, it just seems like your passion to help us. I, I, I see it, I, I witness it. It's not something that I think, it's something I've seen and I know. How do you do that and why? BC, and that's before children. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was busy all the time. Every weekend was busy. But then, then when I chose to be a mom, I had to, one, sort of compartmentalize what I was doing in the community. So then I had to pick those things that were most important to me. Mm -hmm. And working with kids was most important to me. So gotcha. I continued my work uh, with the AKA Academy. I continued my work with any of the partnerships that I had in any of the organizations. And so my Saturdays become full. Mm -hmm. So now that my daughter is no longer playing softball on the weekends, I can go back to that on the weekend. And you make time for that which you believe in. Mm -hmm. And so I, I believe that you have to give back to the community that was so good to you Amen. in order for you to be true to the community. And so it is a must. It is a must. You have to balance your family life and your work life and all of the above. And sometimes it does get hectic. Mm -hmm. And so you got to remember that self-care is important. And so you got to remember whatever your faith might be. And as you can tell that mine is with God. So I give myself to my church on Sundays and I do what is necessary. But on the weekends, um, on those Friday and Saturdays, I try to give myself to the community when possible. And so, you know, one of the things you said was, I mean, to me, it's your passion to give to the community. That's, yes. That's one. Yes. But at SPC, we're focusing on how we can be better partners in the community and what we could do different and what we could do better. And what we're learning is there's a lot of work and opportunity out there. No one can say, well, there's nothing for me to volunteer. I have nothing. No, that's not that's true. That's not true. There's plenty that of work out true. there. So we're trying to make sure that our graduates get better jobs, live better lives, and build better communities. That's our next three-year strategic plan. From um, the role of a judge and an avid community um, leader, what do you think the college should do differently or better to really get involved in the community? Where, what are you, your thoughts? Or any college, it doesn't have to be just SPC, but where does education fit in the support of the community? First of all, I think you guys are doing a great job by offering the free tuition to the kids that are in the target schools, number one. Right. Number two, I would ask you guys to continue to, one, encourage the students that are here to volunteer in the community mm -hmm. because once they see a SBC student, SBC is giving back to the community. Yeah. And so sometimes, you know, the children, they relate to people that are closer to their age. Exactly. And so sometimes when they see a college student and who has a story because each mm -hmm. college student has a story. Mm -hmm. So if they're, if you said, so say you were at maybe one of the local middle schools and or the high schools, I can guarantee you that one of the students may have something in common with one of those students who just does not know which route to take. Mm -hmm. And so I would just encourage you to encourage your students to give back to the community because I think a college as, as a whole, you guys are doing awesome as a whole. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Well, we're really looking at that. And I think for those who are college students in the audience, I think that it's important for you to know just because you're in college doesn't mean you can't volunteer or have a passion or you can't stand in the gap for someone else like Judge Moore is doing. And so as we reach out to you to help in the crisis um, kitchens and the things that we do in the community, it would be great for you to join us. And if you're at a different college, trust you me, they have an area and an opportunity for you to volunteer and stand in the gap. And so my, my next question is about, I would say you. Okay. I get to see you grind every single day, all the time. I've never seen you off. I've always seen you on and doing things. So for me, it's something innate. It's something here that's saying, I have to do this. I have to be out. I have to. What is, I know it's your faith is yeah. one, but what else? What, 
What else? I think it's my gratitude because when I was growing up, it was about community. And so people in the community touch me. Mm -hmm. You know, people in the community made sure that when grandma was at work that I had. And so it was those after school activities. It was those summer camps. It was all of that that somehow is not the same now, but it's uh -huh. still there. And so I think just from a young girl, I saw people giving back. Mm -hmm. I saw mm -hmm. people in my life that were giving back. And so I, it, it is something that is within. And so I try to tell my children, you have to give back. If God has been good to you, you have to give back. You have mm -hmm. to bless somebody else. Well, how do we get back to that? Because we're far from that. I, I remember, um, when I lived with my grandmother, there's a woman named Miss Flossie. Everybody knew Miss Flossie. She used to drive the bus, and Miss Flossie would tell on me. She would straight. She everybody was my parent on the street. Yeah. Every everybody. I feel now we don't even know each other. This is and true. And our neighbors. But how do we get back to those? I used to hear older folks say to me the good old days. Now I'm yeah. saying the good old days. Yes. Um. But how do we get back to where we are a community and we care enough about each other to stand in the gap? I think now people are afraid to be those old time neighbors that they were because if you go to discipline somebody's child oh, now, you that. might get a charge mm -hmm. or the parents may not like it, but that comes to trusting those who live mm -hmm. around you. Mm -hmm. And so our lives are so busy now with all of this technology, we are so busy. When we had less, we had more. Mm -hmm. We had more. That's true. <laughs> we true. had more involvement with each other, but now we have more. Um, so we're just so busy that we get away from it. Mm -hmm. And so the truth of the matter is, yeah, I am one of those people because most of the time I'm not home. So there you go. I I'm pulling up at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So I don't have time necessarily to have those conversations with my neighbors. And one of me, one of my neighbors and I were talking um, just it's just been about a week. And we were just one like her husband has my phone number, but she does not. And she oh, says God. that he knows everybody in the neighborhood <laughs> and he took the time to but she's a nurse mm -hmm. and so she's so busy and I think our careers have just one made it so difficult for us to get to know each other mm -hmm. but I think it's important to not only know each other so that way you can trust each other so we're looking out for each other and each other's children yep. in, in each other's home yeah so I know that one this car should be here so this car has been gone for a few days so one I need to look out you know, at nighttime, right, if I see a car that, that is not familiar so that I can get in contact with my neighbor, because it's not about being nosy. It is just about being that watchman and being caring. our brothers and our sisters keeper. E exactly. Yes. I'm really concerned about family. Yes. I'm really concerned about the demise of family. Yes. Um, we still have children growing up not knowing their history, not knowing their family's history, not understanding. And I know in court, you get to see people getting pulled away and people not being able to be with their family. And I am very concerned about that because in order for us to have a stronger community, we our families have to be stronger. Yes. And I think the work you're doing outside of the courtroom and inside, especially trying to find a um, happy medium in many um, instances where the law will allow is important. But I, I, I just sense that not only are we disconnected family-wise, but our children don't know how to talk to family, don't know how to communicate with family, don't don't know how to play games. We grew up playing games yes. and uh, they don't know how to do that. From, from where you sit and um, what you're doing with um, the AKAs and the youth and the stuff you guys are doing with um, the great debate, um, all of those different things, it encumbers a small group of kids. It does, it does. And we still have thousands of children who are disengaged. What do you think we should do to get those other kids? Because I feel that if we don't get them, they're gonna be in your courtroom or someone's courtroom for the wrong reason. And the truth of the matter is, unfortunately, we have a generation that is being raised by, I would love to say grandmothers, but it's great grandmothers at this particular time. Mm -hmm. And so with that age gap, a lot of great grandmothers aren't one they don't know the technology and I'm not asking mm -hmm. that they do because guess what, you've raised your children. That's right. And so the truth of the matter is they may not know all of those resources, all of those activities that they can do and the children aren't bringing them home. And so the organizations that one, 
uh, they have grand family organizations mm -hmm. and the uh, kinship organizations that try to keep them attuned to what is going on. Because when I see a lot, especially when COVID came around and we had to do Zoom. And so grandma didn't know how, how to zo of Zoom in. Not. If I didn't have a lot of public defenders that were hands on, that went to the homes actually to help set up the Zoom, to, to yeah. help the grandparents Zoom in, we would have lost that population to court, meaning that I would have had to do a pickup order oh, in order man. to bring a child into court about technology. And so unfortunately, we have a lot of parents with today's economic that, that are just so busy working not one, but two jobs mm. in order to stay afloat. So their kids aren't getting that extra stuff that we got at, when we were growing up yeah. because it costs a lot of money just just to live. Yes. And so parents are overwhelmed with just living and it's so hard for them to do the extracurricular activities. And so we do need the schools to be able to make it one easier for any of those extracurricular activities. Mm. One to maybe have that transportation to get those kids home for those activities. And then for anything that we have in the community to make it such that if plausible and possible that these kids could get rides to and from. And I know liability becomes an issue. Yeah. And so we do have a lot of organizations that will try to make it easy to get uh, kids involved, but we are not tapping into a great percent of kids that need it. And it's yeah. just because they have no way to get to those activities. You're talking about the digital divide, you know, those who don't have the technology at home to do the work. And then you're talking about how much harder it is to live these days than it was back then, yeah. the expense of living these days, um, how parents are grinding and children are left at home. Yeah. And then they're, they're left to their own, you know, devices, devices yes. to do, you know, their own thing. And so to me, there has to be some new solution to help them succeed. Even for K-12, they're working on, should we have childcare on campus for, you know, workers? I'm thinking, well, should I have, child care at the college, you know, yeah. how do we um, help? Because if they don't get that help, they won't get educated. If they don't yep. get educated, they're gonna be working three jobs to make yep. ends meet. If they're working three jobs to make ends meet, they're not gonna be able to take care of their children. So it's a, you know, vicious cycle it is that vicious um, cycle. continues to, to turn. So we are looking at how do we help with child care? And we're, it's really not necessarily our, our total mission, but our mission is to help our students. and if that's the help they yeah. need. It's a great mission because some of the young attorneys who are just now starting out and whose student loans have kicked in, I've had a couple new moms that had to leave mm. because guess what? It costs so much money for newborn babies. And if you don't have uh, family members because the trust becomes an issue, but the younger the child is, the more the child care is. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you're, when you're not making a whole bunch of money mm -hmm. and then you're talking about putting it all into child care, well, it's almost cheaper to stay home and try to live off of that one income. So yep. the fact that you guys can do anything or even considering it is just in and of itself is just a wonderful thing. Well, we're definitely yes. trying that. And I'm glad we grew up when we grew up. Yes. <laughs> I think that um, we were built for that era yes. and, and that time and opportunity. Yes. And so I don't know if there's any question that I haven't grilled you on real quick to try to get you, but I do want to say how much I value the work that you're doing in court, out of court, the legacy that you're leaving and what you're doing to help not only young women, but young people um, move forward to do what they need to do. And I just wanna thank you so much for standing in the gap. And I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for doing the Ignite programs. Thank you for doing the free scholarships to the kids that are in the school. And thank you for the Women on the Way program. I think the SPC as a whole, you guys are serving the community. And so thank you. We're trying, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.